All right. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm honored to have uh, Nilesh Marik back to talk about integral yoga. So Nilesh, let's start. Let's start with a deeper question. Why spiritual practice? It's a good uh, way to start actually, Srikant. Um, <clears throat> just before we launch into today's session, we're taking on this question. Uh, we, I'll just put a little bit of background on what we discovered to uh, talk last time. Uh, for those who are joining this, uh, haven't seen the last session, we basically covered the general principles of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy. And we became familiar with terms like um, the Brahman, the self with a capital S, soul, nature, psychic, planes and parts, the transcendent, the universal, the individual, and some of these things. We are going to uh, go through them today and if required, please ask so that we can, it will just make the conversation a bit more integrative because these terms squarely land in the domain of uh, Srikant's question by spiritual practice. Now, why spiritual practice? Each of us have our own answers, but I'll, I'll take the opportunity of uh, quoting the master himself, Sri Aurobindo himself, which we will find, it's a long sentence as most of the sentences are, but uh, each of us from our own angle, when we have begun or are thinking of beginning something called a spiritual practice, experience certain things in our own lives, which he has masterfully covered in a fairly non-flattering or an unflattering manner. So we take it with some humor and I quote, Sri Aurobindo, to the ordinary man who lives upon his own waking surface, ignorant of the self's depths and vastnesses behind the veil, his psychological existence is fairly simple. A small but clamorous company of desires some imperative intellectual and aesthetic cravings, some tastes, a few ruling or prominent ideas amid a great current of unconnected or ill-connected and mostly trivial thoughts, a number of more or less imperative vital needs, alternations of physical health and disease, a scattered and inconsequent succession of joys and griefs, frequent minor disturbances and vicissitudes and rarer strong searchings and upheavals of mind or body. And through it all nature, partly with the aid of his thought and will, partly without or in spite of it, arranging these things in some rough practical fashion, some tolerable disorderly order. This is the material of his existence. Wow. Um, it's not very flattering, as I said. And uh, I think the, I think uh, some of us, some people begin to encounter what in economics is called the law of diminishing returns with this type of existence uh, or the law of diminishing marginal utility, right? We keep doing this and we realize that uh, this ain't it, right? And we seek something beyond. Uh, at the leading edge of the modern rational mental consciousness, which has been the dominant 
mode of human psychological operation in the last 300 years since the um, enlightenment and the industrial revolution. The leading edge has largely been an effort to optimize the pain pleasure mix and improve the individual collective priority equation. And over these centuries, we have seen, actually not just these three centuries, but even the last two, three thousand years, we have seen a wide variety of schools of philosophical thought and doctrine, each with its own variation of the desired goal. Now, when this sort of seeking begins to deal with relations with a deeper and a higher reality, not just the one that we are aware of, as he discussed in, the, in that sentence, but something beyond, some absolute beyond the relative, you could call it that way, or some nominal beyond, behind the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. we can call it some sort of a mystical spiritual turn. That's where we move from an intellectual quest or a mental peregrination to a, a slightly deeper turn where other parts of the being start getting involved. The heart starts getting involved in a very deeper way. And Spiritual practice then can be called, is the phrase we use to denote this kind of seeking mm -hmm. through some sort of effort or vocation or method. Yes, that's our understanding of spiritual practice. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, this uh, And I, though you call it unflattering, I think it is very much true. And that's what matters much more than whether it is flattering or unflattering. And that's, that's the greatness of Sri Aurobindo that he names things. Yes, in, a, in, a, in a typically academic postmodern audience, I have found people taking a bit of getting a bit offended, but <laughs> you, you can, you can ignore, you can ignore that audience <laughs> uh, because they are ignoring reality. They are ignoring everything. So it's worth yeah, ignoring. Yeah, um, so um, this, is a, this is a new audience for me. So I'm just yes. A few eggshells. Yeah, yeah. Don't, 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 there's <laughs> no <laughs> eggshells here. No <laughs> eggshells. Yeah. Uh, so why why does Sri Aurobindo call it integral yoga? Yeah. So let me let's build on you know what. Let's do a quick. I think uh, it'll be helpful if we do a quick panoramic survey of the various classes of spiritual practice that humanity has embarked upon. Right? Uh, let me let me do one thing. Let me just speak to the audience. Um, so folks, the format today is that I'm going to have a conversation with Nilesh in order to try to put the concept of integral yoga on the table for you to make it a little bit more accessible to you. Please use pen and paper to keep track of all your questions. You'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, afterwards. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Nilesh. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, now in our last talk, we had, for those of us who are joining for the first time, we had a discussion about the general description of the nature of reality mm -hmm. uh, in the context of Sri before we come back to this question and, and recontextualize it. Uh, the description of reality involved a, a hierarchical or a holarchical structure of planes and planes of consciousness and both in a vertical and in a horizontal dimension. And uh, you can have a listen to that video just for, you know, but this talk will be independently self-sufficient, although that will enrich it. Now, the point is that a description of reality determines the nature of the description which is embarked upon or the practice. Prescription can be loosely, it's not a very good word in English, but for want of a better word, prescription is what is to be done and how is it to be done to realize something which is beyond me, right? Now, what happens is that uh, I've found that uh, 
there is a relation of mutuality between the description and the prescription. Which means that the nature of the description determines the prescription. And likewise, the prescription tends to confirm that description. Yeah. Yep. A mutuality. Yep. Almost call it a Mobius strip. Mm -hmm. Now, said differently in the spiritual context, in the context of spiritual practice, we could say that the conception of spirit or the divine and his relationship with the manifestation, which includes us, will therefore determine the goal of the spiritual practice and its constitution. Yes, do we agree? Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's look at two, three such scenarios of this description prescription relationship. If our conception is that of an extra cosmic spirit or God, not supra cosmic, but extra cosmic, that is outside the cosmos. An extra cosmic God who imposes some rules or laws for us to observe and follow in this temporary world. And according to that, he or it decides whether we proceed to other permanent domains such as heaven or hell based on our uh, compliance with those rules and laws then it is logical to understand that our practice would tend to be of a moral ethical turn under a kind of carrot stick motivational framework. Yeah, makes sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If our notion is that of some abstract absolute, who has created a world of suffering with transient and fleeting sensations of pleasure, which eventually lead to pain, all of which we have to somehow put up with for a while and then escape from so as to just escape or merge with that abstract absolute, etc. Then our spiritual practice will be geared towards avoidance of life, of phenomenal reality. It will be geared towards painful tolerance and individual liberation or escape. Isn't it? Yes. If our conception is that of a monistic spirit, monistic means a homogeneous single description orientation, one of a particular nature, whose manifestation is maya, in the sense of a persistent and deceptive illusion, which is actually meant to ensnare us, fool us, delude us, then our practice would veer towards also a kind of dissociation and withdrawal. And even abrogation of our spatio-temporal existence to get out of this cycle of what we call birth and death. These three scenarios of description and prescription we are mentioning because in some way they form themes of the picture of reality that has been painted to us 
or or we have tried to figure out in our history and we have adopted the prescription to confirm that description i won't take names but we can recognize mm -hmm. and within the monistic spirit of a more rigid kind there is only one god who's with one book and that has to be followed otherwise perdition etc etc and various unsavory variations thereof okay i wouldn't even call those spiritual though that they are mostly institutionalized religion really now come here to shrikant's question and the context of our our, our discussion today I, i just want to say that this was extremely useful you know the the your point that your conception of divine is going to shape your practice it's it's that is the basis you know what is shapes what should be so that's beautiful point thank you for making that go ahead thank you uh, and uh, the reason uh, nature allows such a long time of trial and error is because of this troublesome mutuality loop between description and prescription because if the prescription confirms that description then i have no reason to change the description isn't it so it takes a lot of time and a lot of pain to say hello is this description the best description to start with because the prescription isn't giving me too much of joy or whatever and some people are happy with it nature has all sorts of uh, i mean the divine manifests in all forms and in all, all forms of consciousness and therefore uh, this this whole trial and error had to go through before something definitive and something beyond this came up and that's that brings us to our conversation today if the conception of the divine unlike the other three is that of a conscious being and all manifestation being an ex expression of that one being's delight ananda which delight is also our innate and ultimate possibility and that possibility exists from a poise of total freedom not in a monistic monodimensional homogeneous sense but across all planes all parts of the macro microcosm continuum then our practice becomes an ongoing self perfection of all our faculties and the unleashing of our yet unknown but latent capacities towards the utter and total fulfillment in our becoming till we are able to experience what the divine experiences full spectrum so so let's put it this way if so so therefore we can draw a distinction that the earlier three in a sense were negative paths whereas the fourth which we just discussed which is shorobindo's view of the cosmos and our role in it and why the hell are we here it is a supremely affirmative spirituality there is no getting away from anything the cosmology or the philosophy which says that all of this trouble of this unbelievably beautiful creation in all its diversity is because it is either pain or illusion somehow leaves an unsatisfactory question then why why all this i mean why go through this stupendous creation if the whole objective was to get away from it i mean does that sound satisfactory well if it is then you are with that prescription description cycle if not then you are invited to explore something more 
So in the negative path, all the instruments of nature, which is our constitution, our mind, life, body, our planar structure, are perceived as burdens to be shed. Isn't it? This body is painful and dull and rigid and full of disease. What a pain. These emotions and desire, my God, what a menace. What a tyranny, tyrannical regimen of energetic impositions on my calm and peaceful nature that throws me off kelter. This mind, an instrument of division, constantly beleaguering me with doubt and etc. etc. So these are all burdens, isn't it? To think of let's think of this is how this is the zeitgeist that we have in many ways also inherited. But in the affirmative path, we can begin to intuit, if not experience, that each of these instruments of nature are not burdens, but they are felt and experienced slowly as openings for divine self-revelation. And these instruments are instruments for total divinization or transformation to execute the divine work here on earth. Wow. Wow. Um, that is how the integral yoga is different from other spiritual paths. Wow. So uh, let me ask a couple of clarificatory questions. Um, so when Sri Aurobindo looks at suffering, um, mistaken ideas, things like that, how does it work? What is his view of that? It's like the child in the first day in maths failing a maths problem or a maths test. Or the guy who wants to uh, go to the gym uh, has a muscle uh, ache because he's tried to lift something. Or a ballet dancer, aspiring ballet dancer before being dancing on Swan Lake has fallen mute many times and probably broken the limbs, isn't it? Got it's it. in exactly the same sense. Wonderful. Second question, um, which is a for metaphysical question. Is the divine one? Um, what is the difference between divine? Is there a difference in the divinity be, within each person, each individual? And how does it relate to divine as such? Um, the divine is one and indivisible, but he is multifarious in his manifestation, number one. So in the manifestation, which is what we call nature, no two things are the same. Even a grain of sand, although it looks similar to the next grain of sand, will be different. Every wave in the ocean is different from the other, other way. Every tree, every branch, every, every fractal of existence is differentiated from the other. So it is extreme diversity. But at the essence, it is the same one indivisible divine. In us, the divine implants a spark of himself, which is what we call the psychic being, going back to our previous talk, Shrikant. For those who are joining this for the first time, the psyche or soul in Sri Aurobindo's parlance is, divine, is defined as a portion of the divine directly inside us from outside manifestation. The mind-life-body complexes is a part of manifestation, which is the movement of consciousness called nature in us, as well as independent self-existent planes. We talked of the seven planes. There is a mental plane independent of our mind, but our mind is an instantiation of that of universal mind. Now, mind, life, and body are parts of nature, but the soul is directly from the transcendent. I don't want to revisit the entire last time's talk, but the, Shrikant, to your question, 
the soul is the divine's representative in us to deal with the whole cosmic nature. Wonderful. As a part of our evolutionary process. And the means given to us for doing so by Sri Aurobindo or in this school of thought is the integral yoga. Wonderful. Uh, you know, I just wanted to make sure that all of that, you know, people have as a background as we dive into the structure of integral yoga. So how do we approach uh, integral yoga? You, you had talked, you know, before a uh, few minutes ago, you talked about four different aspects, starting with the aims and object of uh, integral yoga. Okay, okay. Let's now, why is it called integral? I guess it begs the question, isn't it? Why integral? What does, how could we understand the term, the English word integral? That's a good way to, I think, segue into this. Mm -hmm. I think uh, having thought about this uh, in, in the course of my own uh, study of this and practice, I find it useful to understand the term integral or the significance of integrality in four ways. Number one is the aim and object, which we briefly covered now. The aim and object is the whole play of, actually on the aim and object, let me list the fourth thing and I want to read out something from him for to, to, to really clarify the aim and object, which we just now covered. So the first notion of integrality is in the aim and object. The second is in the stages of the yoga, the totality of the stages. The third way of understanding integrality is what he calls the synthetic method, which is where we will see some parallels with the Bhagavad Gita, which you have started as a subject un unto itself. And the fourth is the fourth significance or meaning of integrality would be in terms of the embrace of the applicability of the integral yoga to those who are called to it. Some of us probably, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So aim and object, stages, synthetic method, embrace of applicability to us. I'd like to quote him to really, I mean, his, his, his writing, his, his, uh, his words obviously are, they carry so much of power that even if we hear it now, it's worth sleeping over it for a few nights. It's, that's the potency of. So aim and objective, we, we, we understood the nature of spiritual practice. We, we, had a, we revisited the various kinds of spiritual practice depending on the description, prescription, mutuality. We saw how integral yoga is radically affirmative in contradistinction to other paths which have, which are slightly different in, in the conception, right? So the aim and object of this is a total transformation of earthly life, the life divine, basically. Now, I will read to, to square off before we move to the second, the aim and object. He says, spirit is the crown of universal existence. Matter is its basis. Mind is the link between the two. Yeah. Oh. Spirit is that which is eternal. Mind and matter are its workings. Spirit is that which is concealed and has to be revealed. Mind and body are the means by which it seeks to reveal itself. Spirit is the image of the Lord of the yoga. Mind and body are the means he has provided for reproducing that image in phenomenal existence. All nature is an attempt at a progressive revelation of this concealed truth 
and a more and more successful reproduction of the divine image. Quote unquote. <sighs> Any questions? Uh, no, this is amazing. Um, so I think it sets forth uh, the aim and the object uh, very you know, crisply. Um, let's go to the stages. What we are going to do, folks, is that I want to, we want to first cover the, the core um, of integral yoga, and then we're going to open it up for questions for everybody, okay? Um, so yes, uh, go ahead, uh, Nilesh, about the stages. Uh, one, one point, because we mentioned soul and nature, we talked about nature. In the aim and object, it is important to make a very important point that all of nature, including the other spiritual paths, are also trying to do the same thing. Eventually, the intention of spirit is one. However, he allows, as if in, as a part of the Leela, various ways and paths and modus operandi for that objective. So, integral yoga, uh, so let's look at it this way. While man's evolution, including the Darwinian and all other forms of evolution that we have that science has discovered or philosophy has contemplated or speculated about are largely all unconscious forms of evolution or semi-conscious forms of evolution, right? In the plant and animal, there is no conscious will. But in man, nature has the opportunity to be able to evolve by a conscious will in the instrument because we have a faculty of self-reflective understanding, a witnessing quality, etc., etc., which other beings don't have. However, our mental will is not enough, not strong, adequate, or versatile enough to complete this turn because of its instrumental limitations. And therefore, ultimately, mind keeps moving around in circles which is what the unflattering description <laughs> earlier was about. Mm -hmm. For a conversion to be made, there has to be a turning of the whole being. Led by the soul behind the heart, which is an emotional principle, which is an affective principle, and by a ascent to a principle above the mind in what are called the spiritual ranges of mind. Okay? I'm briefly discussing this now. We may go into all of this later. Now, integral yoga is a name given to this, to this very specific and precise, yet very comprehensive and total process to achieve very quickly and rapidly what nature has been laboring over millions of years. So, first, so, so what the long and tortuous process of nature has been trying to do unconsciously, integral yoga does for whoever, I mean, agrees to, to adopt integral yoga, it does so consciously in a much more accelerated, efficient, intense, and I would say a rather edgy and even dangerous process. So the aim and object of yoga, the divinization and the revelation of spirit is one aspect we discussed, which is hidden and is the hidden motive of all of creation. But integral yoga does that in a direct process. I will probably, Srikant, can I... Uh, uh, go ahead. Screen. Go ahead. 
just to just to conclude our aim and object subject can you see my screen yes right so uh, i'll read out what is written below the path of yoga the mother made this drawing to explain the mother by the way for those who don't know is the spiritual partner and the executive force of sri aurobindo they have come to the earth for this new creation together it the highest synthesis of the masculine feminine principle we we'll get to that later the mother made this drawing to explain to a child the meaning of yoga man is at the bottom this is for a child right so and the divine is at the top the wavy line is the path of ordinary life and i would dare say many other spiritual practices the straight line is the path of integral yoga wow so how does you know what are the stages through which this proceeds um there are many ways of uh describing the stages but I, for the purposes of an introductory conversation i will use uh, sri aurobindo's terminology of the triple transformation first and foremost this thing cannot be done in a short time or through any rapid or miraculous instant gratification kind of a mantra first of all there are many steps that have to be taken before what is called the supramental descent is possible we mostly live on our surface mind life and body we have to first awake awaken to something called the inner being approach what is called the soul or our inmost being and we have to do various aspects of what is called the sadhana the, the term used for what we do the spiritual practice or for integral yoga is called the sadhana so there are three stages if you will the first is the opening of ourselves to the ranges of our inner being and to begin to live from there outward access the range of our inner being eventually the inmost being and begin to live from there outward governing our outward life by that inner light and force in doing so we discover our true soul our psychic being which is not this outer mixture of mental vital and physical elements and we are able to clearly distinguish today it's all a a mixture a smorgasbord if you will but this first process allows us to make this discernment and at the visceral level be able to distinguish our inner being for these outer elements and the outer elements from each other and finally attune to what we call that divine spark to your earlier question shrikant we have to learn to live from the soul or the psyche purify and orientate by the psychic drive towards the truth the rest of our instrumental nature this first step is called the psychic transformation once the psychic transformation has progressed it's not exactly linear really sequential but it's good to say that once the psychic transformation is well underway the second stage kicks in the second stage there is actually an opening upward so this was inward an opening inward the next 
stage is an opening upward and a descent of a higher principle of the being. But this also is not the supreme force, the transformational force, because there are several ranges of consciousness between the ordinary human and the supramental truth consciousness. For those who, for whom who are joining this for the first time, the supermind is the highest range of the spiritual consciousness, which intermediates between the manifest and the unmanifest. It is the full splendor and power of the divine consciousness in its outlook towards creation. That is the meaning of supermind. In the previous talk, we have talked about it a bit more. Now, these intervening ranges of spiritual mind have to be opened up and their power brought down to the mind, life, and the physical consciousness. This second step is called, in Sri Aurobindo's parlance, spiritual transformation. Spiritual transformation as a term is used by billions of people in different ways, but in the integral yoga, it has a very, very specific meaning. Even psyche or soul, all over the world, there are various ways people use it, but in Sri Aurobindo's yoga, it is very, very precise. Everything in Sri Aurobindo's yoga has a very precise meaning. It is spiritual science. Eventually. So we, we understood the psychic transformation and the spiritual, I wouldn't say understood, but we had a brief overview. And only after the psychic and spiritual transformation mutually have been consummated, can the full power of the truth consciousness of the divine begin to work in the nature. Before that, it doesn't bother. And there are occult reasons why it doesn't. So this third step called the supramental transformation is the completely effective and unveiled manifestation of the truth consciousness of the Brahman directly in the material universe. So the psychic transformation, the spiritual transformation, and the supramental transformation are together called the triple transformation. This calls for a level of self-discipline or sadhana which is very long, very difficult, but even a little of it gained makes the progress and the subsequent step possible. Every stretch in any endeavor Right? In any endeavor that you and I have undergone for mastery, the initial stretch makes possible the next stretch. Makes possible the next stretch. Only here, it is the ultimate stretch. So, the supramental transformation is the pinnacle of the integral yoga. And so, the second connotation of the term integral is in the totality of its method in its stage-wise achievement of a total unveiled divinization of human nature and earthly life. Wonderful. Um, next, uh, let's see, I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. Um, so you wanted, you had put four things down. We've covered the aim and the object and the stages. So now we have synthetic method and how would one apply it? Um, how, how, how does this apply to us? Okay, uh, for the synthetic method, uh, the best way to begin to think of it is in terms of our three primordial faculty imperatives. Our three primary drives or drivers, right? The, the first or one of the drivers is the imperative or what we call the cognitive imperative. The imperative to know. The second imperative we have 
is the affective imperative. The imperative to love. The third, we can call it the conative. C-O-N-A-T-I-V-E, the conative imperative, which is the imperative to do. So these three in the Indian lingo, which you, I'm sure you have covering in the, in the Bhagavad Gita are called the Jnana Marga. Sri Aurobindo calls it the Jnana Yoga. The cognitive imperative to know is Jnana Yoga. The affective imperative to love is the Bhakti Yoga. The conative imperative to do is the Karma Yoga. The Bhagavad Gita, since we have already, this has been covered in this forum, begins with an understanding of the Karma Yoga and the dilemma involved in action, which is what Arjuna goes through and the call of duty and, and the various scales of understanding of Karma begins with a moral, ethical, and then eventually it proceeds to the acne of the spiritual imperative. The next, as you progress in the Bhagavad Gita, the next thing that will come up is the imperative of jnana. Because the charioteer advises Arjuna that until you know your, your drive to action is misguided and you're all over the place. So you have to know. And know not in terms of intellectual knowledge, know the meaning of spirit, know the will of God. So if the karma imperative is the instrumental fulfillment of the divine will, the knowledge imperative is the purusha realization, the identification and the consciousness contact with the Lord of the nature, with the Lord of the yoga. And then towards the final chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, he lets out what is called the supreme secret, which is bhakti. Not love as we understand in human terms, but the pure unadulterated ecstasy of union with the divine in various terms and hues. Now, <clears throat> coming back to our discussion today, in the history of spiritual practice, we have, we find there are various schools and marks and paths of each of these three. And there is a tendency of each of these to take a kind of an exclusive uh, sort of uh, orientation. Not entirely, but largely. So we have the Bhakti schools, the Vaishnava schools, Sri Chaitanya and uh, Sri Ramakrishna. And, and then there is, of course, the Gnostic. And there are, you know, everywhere in the world, there have been uh, the, Sufi, uh, the Sufi movement, Bhakti oriented, love for the divine, devotion. Then there is the Purushamat, the Vedanta, the original Vedanta, as it originally stood, and especially the later Vedanta, took the Purusha approach of pure Jnana, of the Purusha almost to the exclusion of the Prakriti. Because in that uh, description or that, or that cosmology, Prakriti was all Maya or illusion. So the Jnana Marga was a purely masculine, if we call it that. To the exclusion of love was looked at as some sentimental stuff. Let's not get there type of thing. And karma, why karma? This is all illusion. Why work? Etc. Etc. And then, of course, the whole, uh, a large part of the modern civilization is around doing things, right? Karma, work. But it's mostly misguided because it is bereft or divorced of the true knowledge and the bhakti. So it is just mindless doing, which is what uh, is the first lesson that Arjuna gets from. Uh, the charioteer. Nilesh, can now, I ask you one question at this stage? Please. Um, what about Raja Yoga? Where does Raja Yoga fit in uh, this system, both for in the um, Bhagavad Gita tradition and in Aurobindo tradition? Raja Yoga is a 
process of self discipline through mental control and so if we take a different cut now and we look at traditional hatha yoga which starts with the body and pranayama which starts with the vital nervous energies then raja yoga begins it uses the others but its primary focus is mental control so raja yoga eventually ends up taking a sattvic turn towards moral ethical service to humanity kind of an orientation but the objective of raja yoga is control but not the transformation of nature that is the difference mm -hmm. got it raja yoga raja yoga's vision or understanding of cosmology is not that the instrumentation of nature is also fully concealed spirit which can be liberated completely into a total flowering of divinity raja yoga is more around control and we know that when you are only stopping at control you have some success but eventually the intractable elements make themselves make their trouble some appearance let's let's put it that way okay. thank you so um so the synthetic method has two connotations um first is that he shows when we start the integral yoga we realize that we can start with any of the three this is another very important message of the gita that depending on the individual nature i can start with karma you can start with bhakti and somebody can start with gyana or some mixture of the two but if any of these are taken to their ultimacy we will perforce be drawn into the other two you cannot avoid it so to take a simple example if you love somebody you feel for that person there is a identity and the real meaning of knowledge or gyana is knowledge in identity so if you love somebody passionately totally completely utterly it is as if you are in direct resonance with his or her experience that is gyana and if you love somebody and are in identity with somebody's consciousness you would do anything for that somebody that is karma in a human and a context of analogy these are not consummated to their perfection but when the object of adoration and knowledge and work is the divine the divine himself makes a complete synthesis at a at the highest level so that is what is meant by the synthetic method of the integral and this is squarely in the message of the yoga of the gita of the bhagavad gita wonderful so nilesh i'll ask you one last question and then we will go to questions from everybody sure how would one begin in uh in a practice of uh, integral yoga what is required for somebody who wants to do this um shyorbindo and the mother uh themselves list three things okay i will we will we'll, we'll answer this in two ways one is what does one have to do and the other is what does one have to be and obviously they are intimately related in terms of action take the word loosely they say there are three things necessary and sufficient aspiration rejection and surrender aspiration rejection and surrender aspiration is the single pointed relentless turning of the whole being much like a rising flame towards consciousness contact with the supreme power 
aspiration is the single pointed relentless turning of the entire being not just the mind not just the will not just thought if everything it's as if the whole being is gathered up and rises up like a flame rejection is the vigilant and resolute refusal to engage or entertain the impulsions of the lower nature that is mired in ignorance bondage and error normally in, in the spiritual world we don't hear the term rejection how can we reject allow everything isn't it well no in the integral yoga rejection is central to the yoga because we are our current evolution of this complex is rooted in the ignorance in the unconscious so without an eye for rejection and a constant vigilance for discrimination and rejection this yoga cannot proceed or let's put it this way the aspiration will be compromised without the rejection and vice versa third surrender surrender is the most difficult and yet the most central among the three what does surrender mean surrender is the progressive replacement of the individual will and action by the higher will and action the replacement of the individual will and action by the higher will and this requires a little bit more of explanation because just now we said aspiration and re rejection right which has to begin by the individual will and action isn't it so but this it requires basically suffice it to say for now that surrender once the initial aspiration and rejection has started these three things actually constitute a mutually reinforcing virtuous loop a mutually reinforcing virtuous loop as there is greater aspiration the capacity of rejection and the capacity of surrender increase as there is greater rejection so and so and then when there is surrender which means a total complete annihilation of the ego in its in its deleterious sense not in terms of the of the core psychic individuality but in the egotistical sense then the surrender becomes complete but the surrender cannot become complete until the other two have also progressed to a certain critical mass you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. so they each reinforce each other at several critical thresholds of achievement or progress in the sadhana and surrender indicates that at one point there is a transfer of power wow um oh. okay uh nilesh would you like to say anything more uh before we open it up for questions any any kind of closing thoughts anything because you know this is a introduction so uh any anything that you want to say um you know you're welcome to come back and to exp you know expand on anything uh in future meetups but anything that you would like to say now yeah uh, the, uh, these three as i said are in terms of action but in terms of attributes there are only two things faith and will it's as simple as that faith because this this path is long and difficult and arduous and at several points it is possible for one to be hijacked by the adverse forces of doubt and and uh, you know disappointment and frustration and etc etc so the faith is absolutely necessary because that there is it is worth remembering that this is this what is being done here is the original intention of spirit and therefore however difficult it, it is or it seems this is not only possible the divinization of nature and the life divine is not only possible but inevitable that conviction at a felt sense in the inner being 
becomes the the basis of faith and the other is will because otherwise why bother we can live that normal unflattering life right so yeah i think that's wonderful that's where i would like to wonderful thank you uh, thank you nilesh uh, folks uh, now it's time for questions go ahead and type exclamation mark or raise your hand uh, in Zoom, if you'd like to ask a question. So we'll start with uh, Judith. Judith, go ahead. Hi, uh, Neelish. This, this was very interesting. Um, I found this to be like, uh, make a lot more sense to me than most things I've heard. Um, I liked um, the prescription description that you began with. Um, so I do have, um, a question that's a little gonna be probably hard for me to present, but I'll try. Um, it has to do with um, this idea of evolution. So in biology, the idea of evolution isn't that everything proceeds to a better place. It just, everything proceeds according to its environment and the adaptations occur according to the environment, not occur according to what is better or better in terms of like some notion of uh, hierarchy or, or in comparison to something else, you know, just what works in the environment and animals adapt and nature adapts. So nature, um, is, uh, is fully concealed divinity within nature, you said, right? But some of this feels like it has a basis in mental faculties. So in order to progress, how would one with somewhat with limited mental faculties progress toward um, this spiritual growth? Um, are, and would this somehow um, cause us, not if, not, I'm not I'm imagine if people are on the right spiritual path, it's, as you described here, but um, it just feels like they're sort of like a better or worse or more progressed and less progressed. Now, and it does make sense to me, the things you say. So like on one hand, I can, um, um, what's the word, like grasp and, and feel the correctness of it. But on the other hand, I feel like there's something missing that has to do with like, it isn't, isn't everything that's here, here as part of supporting each other. Like, so like if mm -hmm. plants yeah. had to progress oh. to be like us to get there, would that, is that not making sense? We need plants the way plants need us. You know what I mean? So that's kind of my question. I'm not sure whether I got the end, but you said quite a few things. You first uh, talked about uh, Darwinian evolution or the evolution of form. So the first thing I would say is that we need to distinguish between evolution of form and evolution of consciousness. Evolution of form is a precursor and a preliminary preparation to make the form capable for the evolution of consciousness. So Darwinian evolution and the physical evolution of the body and the survival of the fittest and all those things with all their reservations have some role to play in the evolution of nature. And each of the capacities that nature has provided us, which is the body, the physical consciousness, the life energy or the vital consciousness and the mind, which is the mental consciousness has to evolve till at some point, as I mentioned, there is this transfer of power. When there is the transfer of power, the higher principle takes charge of whatever has been done till now through the unconscious and relatively slow and tortuous and tardy process of nature and suddenly subjects it to an unbelievable acceleration. But when that happens for whom will vary from person to person, 
based on our current life and based on our past lives and based on our cosmic destiny and based on our soul trajectory and the divine intention behind our manifestation, which we may not know in the beginning, but we will progressively realize. But the important point to understand is that form evolution is necessary before the, to use Srikant's term, the function, the function of the eventual evolution of consciousness will eventually take up the form and mold it to its purpose. But form itself has to form itself. Form as a noun has to form as a verb itself for function to take charge of the whole process. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nilesh. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, did you want to say more? Oh, uh, and the other thing I think, Judith, you mentioned was that uh, mental development, yes, but you will notice that in the three uh, criteria listed, mental development or philosophical PhDs or all those were not listed. Aspiration, rejection, and surrender. If there is sincere aspiration, I can say from example that there are many whom, when you look at, you'll say, well, will this person, person be capable of it? Probably not. And yet that person did far better than a far more academically or uh, career wise or university wise or whatever other criteria you take, whom you thought should be, well, should be prime candidate for this, but they have been a complete failure. So the ways of spirit are not necessarily the ways our mental understanding operates. So that is a point I thought is important to mention because you said that somebody's mental capacity is higher or lower. Those are not really very relevant. Like uh, a Down you. syndrome person would not have um, logical aspiration and yet may exhibit more spirituality than someone who reads a lot and absolutely thank you uh wonderful thank you um folks go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to ask questions jyoti you're next okay firstly thank you very much for the very knowledgeable <laughs> presentation my question to you is in the last piece that you presented that shrikant asked about the, how to practice integral yoga. And three important ingredients are aspiration, rejection, and then surrendering. Okay, now people who have aspirations, but they are surrounded by Maya, you have to have a certain amount of dhan, money, to support yourself and to support your children in this kind of a civilization that we are living in. And then you also have the power to surrender that I take as an ego. That to me is the highest form. My question to you is by having, not having to reject everything that you should reject according to the integral yoga, can you still like live a life of spirituality? Am I making sense? I need to qualify the uh, matter about rejection. The rejection is not about rejecting the normal life or uh, rejection is rejection of the impulsions of lower nature. So I have to be vigilant about the pull of anger, jealousy, greed, lust, wickedness, the pressure of rejection is not rejecting others or rejecting the world or rejecting my job. It is rejecting elements in my nature that prevent me from the ascension and from the inward journey. So everything about material conditions, yes, some dhan and some from person to person, he or she has to determine. But I would say they are relatively minor or even irrelevant in the context of rejection of the importunities 
of the lower nature in oneself and in others. So it may mean that I have to reject things in myself and if there are people around me in my workplace or in my relationships or in my whatever, who are anti-divine, then I would rather not interact with them in that sense. And I wish them well. I don't have to demonstrate any great drama. I quietly withdraw into my own work and not be a part of their lives. That's all we are talking about. Thank you for clearing it for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, let me, uh, let me, I'm going to ask a follow-up question uh, on that. If anybody else has questions, go ahead and type uh, exclamation mark. So uh, one of the things that really struck me about integral yoga is that it is a this worldly yoga. It does not damn this world. It actually embraces this world uh, and brings the divine into this world. Is, is that correct? Yes. Because that's profoundly yes. different from uh, many different practices, which is a way of trying to get to divine by rejecting parts of this world, not just uh, you know, your ignorance, but kind of core parts of the world itself. Whereas this one is all about embracing the world. You're trying to what the rejection, surrender, it, it is, neg you're doing a negation, you're removing things from you, but what you're removing are things like ignorance, things that uh, you're not removing parts of the world, you're removing parts of things that do not conform with the divine, you, that do not Absolutely. flow accordingly. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Bang on. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Uh, if anybody has questions, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Um, so let's, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, okay, Ambika, Ambika followed by Jyoti. Uh, your, your questions take priority over mine. Uh, Ambika. So Nilesh, what were you practicing before you came to Integral Yoga and Sri Aurobindo? And how did this change your life? Well, I was, uh, I had, uh, I mean, okay, it goes about 20 years back. So I started with Vipassana meditation and uh, then I got into Hatha yoga and Pranayama. I then got extensively into, into this whole polymathic game of various subjects and study and extensive study of philosophy. Then I did a little bit of um, Buddhist practice uh, a bit more than Vipassana into Buddhist philosophy and um, mindfulness meditation. Then I got into, you know, I read up a bit about the Kabbalah and the, and the Christian Gnostic tradition. Um, being with Yasuhiko, I have been obviously exposed to a lot of uh, some of Zen and uh, and more recently, you know, the you know, the, the courses that we are doing together and, and uh, some of this I had read earlier. And I wouldn't say I had a very organized practice that this is the only thing, but it was a bit of um, eclecticism of, uh, but when this came across my life, all of that, it just, it was a complete, uh, everything else was just a preparation and you know, nothing else made sense or it made sense only to the extent that it had prepped me as I use the metaphor you uh, need to play with trinket jewelry <laughs> and five carat gold and 10 carat gold before you understand the value of 24 carat gold so it is just a preparation and once this when you get the taste of this then this is Amritam Wonderful. Nothing more required. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nilesh. So finally, I just want to say that um, when I decided to dive into Indian philosophy on 52 living ideas, because it's it has always been my plan to get to it, because I think of it as you, everybody needs to understand at least three civilizations. They have to understand the West, they have to understand China, and they have to understand India, because these are like really big civilizations that have contributed so much and you can't really 
you have to take in that. And I found Sri Aurobindo, if I have to pick one thinker, I think Sri Aurobindo is a fantastic choice. Uh, and I have, I have decided to do that simply because the, firstly, his idea about inner and outer of the unity between the divine and the world, unity between the inner and the outer, that is profound. It integrates a lot of what the Indian thought is from the past, including Bhagavad Gita, but I think it speaks most dramatically to the modern world. And even to the West, I think it speaks. It has the potential of speaking. So that's how I see Aurobindo in the Indian tradition as seen from the world tradition. Uh, what do you think? You're asking me? Or yes. No, no, you, you are Nilesh. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the reasons that the whole spiritual path has got a slightly unfavorable impression with people in the world is because they think it's an escapist kind of a thing. So people in, um, in the world who are doing things, who are in the creative space, in business, in enterprise, in, um, you know, who are actually doing things that make our lives comfortable, right? have a kind of an aversion to the spiritual path because of this precise nature of this otherworldly escapist, a divorce from the outer, from the inner, a divorce of spirit from matter, etc., etc. And that has happened for several thousand years. But when, if and when that, that the, the doer, the karmic orientated people understand that there is a scope of uh, a type of spirituality is which not negating but supremely affirmative which is not about turning away but a complete utter total fulfillment then the whole appeal the whole situation changes yes. at the other on the other hand uh, people who are into the spiritual path that they shun things and turn away from things and reject various essential elements are in some ivory tower, uh, so to speak. And it is as equally a wake up, wake up call for them saying that you are, you have, you have turned, but you have turned in a kind of a compromise. How about a path and process where there is no question of any compromise, but total liberation, total freedom, total fulfillment. Now this, is an appeal which is universal because it uh, doesn't leave out anything, includes everything. At the same time, both sides of the spiritual matter dualism have to understand that the only principle that, have to, that has to be rejected here is the ego desire principle. Because either of the two with the ego desire principle are equally doomed. It doesn't matter whether you give yourself the nomen nomenclature of a materialist or a spiritualist. If hiding behind that is the surreptitious subterranean presence of the ego desire complex, then you are nowhere. It's not going to get you anywhere. So that is why the rejection principle has to be understood. Even sacrifice in the context of the traditional spiritual practice is sacrifice the good life, right? Mm -hmm. or, to, or somebody says you have to sacrifice this. In the integral yoga, there is no sacrifice except the sacrifice of the lower at the altar of the higher. Not the sacrifice of me for you or you for him, but within me, the sacrifice of the lower for the higher. Beautifully put. Finally, um, what's a good book by Aurobindo on integral yoga. Where does he talk about it? Uh, I think we, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you can, for the, uh, if you have, if one wants to get to the practice part directly without the philosophy, but with 
a reasonable amount of philosophy to make sense of the background of the practice, I would suggest the synthesis of yoga. So a lot of what we covered, the synthetic method and um, you know the fulfillment of nature and spirit and the and the individual tracks of the karma, the jnana and the bhakti resulting in a culminating synthesis of what is called the yoga of self-perfection. Then the book to start with is the synthesis of yoga. It's freely available on the internet. You can order uh, a hard copy or a physical copy from Amazon or download a PDF from the internet. Wonderful. That's a good starting point. Wonderful. And uh, again, of if somebody wants a good overview of Sri Aurobindo's thought, what's a good place for them to start? For his thought, which is the description part. So the synthesis of yoga is for the prescription, for the doing, for the practice and that, for the cosmology and the philosophy and the whole spiritual vision for why we are here, what is the divine, what is the destiny of humanity? What is the mechanism of the of the of the ignorance and the method and and the knowledge, the meaning of knowledge, the the epistemology of knowledge, the mechanism of evolution, the stages of spiritual evolution through history? For all of this, for a philosopher, there is nothing to beat the life divine. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. And um, for the people who are who I would like to add for the people who like poetry more than prose, prose, such as Ambika among us and maybe others, the greatest book written in the history of human civilization, in my opinion, is Savitri. Uh, can you just tell a little bit about Savitri? You, you, now, you, now you've piqued everybody's curiosity. Say, say a little bit more about the book Savitri, please. Savitri is a book it's an epic. It's set in the context of a mythological story. But, and the story is uh, by itself is a nice story, but the larger significance, Savitri is the poetic rendering in excruciating detail of the yoga of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Wow. Culminating in the new creation. Wow. Wow. S A V I T R I, yes. Savitri. Wonderful. All right. Uh, we are uh, out of time. So this is, uh, you know, Nilesh, thank you so much. Um, I think we did a decent job of introducing the topic, but I think one of the points that you are making uh, when we started discussing the topic is that really you need to practice in order to go deep into this area. This is not a purely intellectual uh, discipline. This is an issue of practice. Uh, do you want to say something about that, the, the importance of practice? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one way of saying it is that one can attend several lectures about the principles of love. What is love? How to practice love? What are the various theories of love? But you have to love. Otherwise, uh, no, no, 20 PhDs on the subject of love for somebody who hasn't had the opportunity to love a man or a woman is virtually useless. So the, so it is a, it is a loose metaphor I'm using for the point that you're asking beyond. Uh, so you have to get into the yoga because it is an invitation of the divine, no discussion, nothing else can replace the intimacy and the consciousness contact with the Supreme. And the integral yoga through the, through the sadhana of Sri Aurobindo and the mother has established the possibility of the yoga as an active and living power in our midst, provided we are able to tune into it. That's what I would say. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nilesh. And thank you very much, everybody. Great questions. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. Namaste. Bye.